Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Um, I'm Stacy Smith, the Director of Outreach and Events, or uh, Virtual Events these days. Thanks for uh, participating in today's program. Um, RMI just recently wrapped up our Champions of Maryland Manufacturing program, where we recognize manufacturers, businesses, government entities, um, uh, nonprofit organizations and academic institutions that did extraordinary things over the last two years related to uh, the manufacturing sector. And today's program is featuring some of those champions and their efforts that relate to energy efficiency and sustainability. So we're going to hear from some of those champions. Um, we're going to, um, we have a, a stellar moderator who we were pleasantly surprised and excited to see that she was able to spare the time to be with us. And I'll introduce or have Mike Galeazzo introduce her shortly but um, thanks for joining us before we roll into the program we have a couple of sponsors and partners that we'd like to recognize uh, first our promotional partners who've been really wonderful to us uh, John Dinkle Dinkle Business Development and Vicki Franz from I-95 Business and we'll put their contact information in our follow-up email in case you're not on their distribution list and would like to be they uh, promote a lot of great information and programs and events that are going on throughout Maryland that may be of interest to you. We also have uh, two sponsors for today's program and I will start with our supporting sponsor, um, Breaker Box, which is a, a wholly owned subsidiary of Exelon. And we have joining us, Craig Wilson. We've asked Craig to say a few minutes or, or say a few words in a minute. <laughs> you got <laughs> it, Stacy. Thank you, Stacy, And uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first, I wanna thank Stacy Smith and the team at RM for the opportunity to speak with you today. I also want to applaud everyone on this call today. Your participation shows you understand the importance of energy, its value, and the impact it has on your business, because trust me, not everyone gets it. Today, you'll learn some, about some amazing energy efficiency projects and how they reduced the quantity of energy being used. <clears throat> and the <clears throat> quantity of energy being used. Efficiency is an important way to reduce your energy costs, but it is only half of the equation. In energy, the cost equation looks like this. Cost equals price times quantity. I know, sounds simple, but having an energy procurement strategy that works with energy efficiency with your energy efficiency project is critical. For example, when you reduce your energy consumption, you reduce your peak demand charge as well, and that can have a big impact on the price you pay for energy. That is why it is so important to have a procurement strategy that encompasses your energy efficiency project. Skip this step and you will leave dollars on the table. By reducing price and quantity together, you can maximize your cost savings and value. Energy procurement can be a complex and time consuming process, but you do not have to go this alone. BreakerBox is an energy consulting company that specializes in energy procurement and specifically in working with innovative manufacturers like you who are considering an energy efficiency project. We are here to help. The good news is just by being here today, you've already taken the first step. So with that, thank you to the panel and to you, Mary, for moderating. I'm excited to learn from all of you today. If you have any questions, please contact me. I look forward to hearing from you. Stacy. Thanks, Craig, and, and thanks for your sponsorship of the program. We really appreciate the support. Um, again, we'll put all the sponsor contact information in the email that we're sending out this afternoon after the program's over. So the format for today, um, we're, uh, we have a moderator, Dr. Mary Tong from the Maryland Energy Administration, who will um, ask, a, uh, she's gonna tell us a little bit about MEA's uh, grant program, that, that energy grant program that we're involved with. Then I'll say a few words about um, RMI's involvement in that program. Um, Dr. Tong will then ask, a question of each of our panelists and then if time allows we'll ask a general question or two of the panelists and we've allotted 15 minutes at the end of the program for Q&A and uh, we invite you to submit your questions through the chat box and we will be reviewing them throughout the program and then addressing those that we can uh, get to at the end of the program in the last 15 minutes. Um, Mike do you want to go ahead and um, introduce Dr. Tong and uh, just uh, say a few words about their participation this morning? Hey, Mike, you might be on mute. Not mute me. All right, Stacy, can you hear me now? Stace? Yes, we can hear you, Mike. Oh, sorry. No, we yes, can hear you. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Mary Beth Tong, it's uh, Dr. <laughs> Mike Galeazzo, and I want to welcome you and thank you for taking time out to join us today. Uh, I want everybody to understand that the Maryland Energy Administration is, is, a, 
is an office or department within the governor's office. And we've enjoyed an amazing partnership with, with uh, Dr. Tong and the staff that she mentioned earlier, like Chris Rice and, and uh, Caitlin Madeira and Eric Coffin. We really appreciate it, Mary. Uh, you are a, your, your team's super, and we appreciate the opportunity to be a kind of a partner in progress and serving manufacturers. Uh, so I just wanted to, to start with that. Thank you. And Peter, if you don't mind, I know you don't like being surprised, but I'd like for you to add a few words too, to, the, to thanking Mary for her partnership. So I'm gonna turn it over to Peter Gorley real quick. Peter? Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm in a hospital down, <laughs> at a hospital down in Houston. That's why I'm not visible, um, but I'm doing great. <laughs> I'm heading, heading back on a plane to Baltimore tomorrow. Um, yeah, you know, I've, I, I've, I've loved this relationship since it started. And the best thing that ever happened to us was Dr. Mary Tuck. Yeah, um, you've, you've been a, a, a really great proponent of, of RMI and manufacturing, and we're, you know, very indebted to you and, and your very, very capable staff. Uh, Brandon Bowser is another person yep. who's, who's played a great role. And in the past, Rory Spangler, you know, you've just had an all-star cast of people that we've worked through. And at the end of the day, you know, all those folks make, you know, what we're trying to do, you know, have good results. And so I, I just really want to give a heartfelt thank you. And with that, let's turn it over to Mary Tom. Well, thank you uh, very much. I'm, I'm not sure who that is you're talking about, uh, who this Mary Tom person is, um, but I do appreciate all your kind words. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm thrilled to have Peter on the line. Um, uh, you know, I know, uh, Peter, you've been through a lot. We've all been pulling for you and, and uh, you're an inspiration to all of us. Um, but I think all the credit goes to uh, to you and your team as well. And I couldn't do anything without my team. And and, and um, I do appreciate your kind words about them as well because they really do an awesome job. And um, I never have to worry about getting things done because I know they're going to get stuff done. Um, but the manufacturers is what we're all here about uh, today. And they're doing a really awesome job here in Maryland as well. And they've been through some tough times in Maryland, so hopefully we can, as we move forward, help them out. And that's what it's all about. As you know, the governor um, views manufacturing in Maryland as very, very, very important. And part of his, um, you know, Maryland is open for business programs. And particularly now with COVID, it's even more critical. And many of the manufacturers have stepped up to the plate uh, when needed. So um, thank you for inviting me here. I'm just really, um, thrilled to be here and uh, to help you out in, in this very, very close to our heart um, uh, session on energy efficiency. And we have some star players here, I must say. Some of these folks are folks we've worked with and uh, have done an awesome job. So let's get into our uh, panel. Uh, our first panelist is Elena uh, Kasi, and uh, there is a, um, a bio, a more extensive bio uh, available that you can read, but um, I think she's going to be telling us some really awesome stuff about her company. And I will tell you, she's got an awesome company. Um, this is one we've worked with. Um, she's the uh, president of the Cecil County-based Aquafin, um, and she's here with us. And uh, Elena, um, first of all, it's, it's thrilling you kind of break the mold, you know, um, women and energy isn't, aren't all that, um, there's not that many of us and, and women in manufacturing, you know, that's, that's really cool to uh, see you at the head of this company. And under your leadership, uh, Aquafin took a full advantage of various resources available to Mar Maryland manufacturers to cut energy costs. And yeah, if you could tell your story, that, that would be awesome. Um, about what you've done with your company and energy efficiency. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me be a part of this. Um, so as Mary Beth um, mentioned, we're a manufacturer based in Elkton, Maryland. Uh, we were, our company started in 1989 down in Elkridge, Maryland, and we moved up to Sixth <laughs> County in the late 2000s when our business expanded and we outgrew our first facility. Uh, we manufacture high performance construction materials for commercial and industrial waterproofing and concrete repair. Our building was built in the mid 60s and really hadn't had many major upgrades before we acquired it. And when we moved in, we spent quite a bit of money on equipment to enable our processes, as well as addressing some major upgrades, you know, due to years of neglect. Um, 
we always wanted to do more with the building as far as energy efficiency was concerned, but we really lacked both the funding and the expertise. And it was just a little over a year ago that I attended a similar presentation as a guest, like many of you today. And at the time I was a little skeptical, but I figured, you know, what do I have to lose? And I'm always open to new opportunities and to learn from others. And just over a year since I attended that um, presentation, we've completed our own energy upgrade project thanks to the efforts of RMI and the Maryland Energy Administration. So just a little bit about our project. Um, we were, we got together with RMI and uh, Peter and Nandini really walked us through the whole process and did a complete engineering evaluation of our building and helped us identify areas where we could upgrade. And the three projects that we focused on were LED lighting upgrade, um, HVAC upgrades, and upgrades to our transformers. So our overall project cost was $175,000. And we, out of, to pay for that, um, we received $37,000 in Delmarva grants, as well as $69,000 in MEA grant money, and then an additional $55,000 from an MEA um, low interest loan to help pay for energy upgrades by deferring payments for the first 13 months. So the entire $175,000 project really only cost us about $14,000 out of pocket. And that is a project that we would not have been able to complete without the assistance that we got from this program. So just a little bit more about the project. You know, we upgraded about 240 lighting fixtures, all of the lighting in our building. We replaced nine um, mini split ductless HVAC units two commercial rooftop HVAC units, and um, eight transformers for our manufacturing facility. And in order to do all of this, you know, we had to submit a, it was about a 26 page report um, application for the grant process. And like I said, it was, it was RMI who really did the majority of the, the work for us and helped us through it. And it was their expertise and that made it possible. Um, if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be where we are today. So one of the other things that I was excited about in the project is that we were awarded the money in April, and that was right in the middle of COVID, the real shutdown. And for us, we were an essential business the entire time. We were able to complete the work throughout the shutdown, continue, keep our facility going. And also we worked with local vendors. So all of the contractors that did the work are Maryland-based businesses. So in addition to you know, boosting our employees' morale because they saw we were still doing things and investing in the company in, during a pandemic, we were helping other local businesses also maintain their business. So I, again, I can't say thank you enough to the entire team at RMI and to the, you know, to the Maryland Energy Administration for making these kinds of projects possible because being a manufacturer and, and seeing your local government support you as a manufacturer based here in the U.S. is really an awesome opportunity and I hope others on this call are able to take advantage of the same types of opportunity that we had. So thank you also for having me today. Thank you so much. That's an awesome story and, and I'm familiar with part of it and um, I'm hoping at some point we'll be able to come by and see your, your company and see all the changes you've made. And uh, I know there is some significant annual savings um, that's going to more than pay for the, um, the money that you put out to get it done. Well, thank you for reminding me. That was the last That's right. Time. Our overall energy consumption reduction is about 68% of before we started the project. And that's going to equate to about $28,000 in savings every year. And I'll tell you $28,000 right to the bottom line is a great opportunity for us as a company to continue to reinvest in hiring more people and upgrading our other systems. So I'm really excited by this. And that's the cool thing about, um, about this is that the energy savings is real dollars, you know, say green cash, right? Hard, hold, hard, cold cash. And that can be used then to offset the costs later. But there is some upfront costs, and that's what we were happy to be able to help you uh, with that, along with some of your other partners. And I thought your job, um, your job comments were, were really important too. It hit at a critical time, 
um, people were still working. So, you know, that there, that's a component that we didn't expect, obviously, when this all started. But uh, thank you for your comments. Really appreciate it. Um, next, we have the Cornelius. Uh, we have Cornelius Grupp, president and CEO of Seacare with us. Um, Seacare is an Anne Arundel County-based manufacturer of skin care, hair color, hair care, off the um, over-the-counter and personal care products. Cornelius Sea Care has been working with RMI and MEA since 2015 to become more energy efficient and cut costs and take advantage of the many resources provided through the state to help you do so. Your company's efforts on this front have been extraordinary, so much so that the company has earned several special awards and designations and is now a role model for manufacturers and other companies across the world to emulate. And I know I've heard about you in many different um, uh, roles um, and, and different venues. So I, I know you're out there hitting the pavement, running in, and doing a lot of good work. So can you tell us briefly about some of Seacare's energy efficiency initiatives and successes? Absolutely. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. And uh, thank you for the whole RMI team for uh, getting this set up. Um, and Peter, it's so great to see you here today. Um, I, I didn't expect you to be here, so it's, it's even a, a bigger surprise, um, and that makes us very happy. Um, so yes, we are a, a family-owned business, and sustainability is something that is very dear and important to us, as we, as manufacturers, have a huge responsibility on society around us that we act in and the environment that we operate in. And so uh, since 2015, we've been part of the RMI Energy Program, and since then have uh, steadily added or continue to add to our uh, sustainability strategy. Um, sustainability is not a momentary snapshot, it's something uh, that uh, you have to commit to and it's a journey that we are on to continuously improve um, how we are uh, within, uh, within this field. Uh, in 2016, similar to Elena, your story, um, we uh, received uh, the CNI grant and a loan uh, to from uh, MEA uh, to move forward with a $1.4 million energy project that similarly focused on our HVAC systems, uh, a new roofing, um, our temperature controlled, zone controlled uh, um, system that we installed. Um, we also removed all of our LED lights, um, which uh, was similar to your story, really, Elena, an awesome project where we had so much support from RMI to really uh, support us in this push. Uh, and get it done at, at an incredible speed. And that for us only resulted in a 35% reduction of energy. Um, so I think we do have some work to do after hearing uh, the percentages you were able to uh, achieve. Nevertheless, uh, in 2016, we won the Maryland Department of, Envir uh, of Environment Green Registry Leadership Award, uh, which we're super proud of and we still show off on our wall and to uh, our customers. Uh, and since then, we have continued uh, on, on this path and this journey. Uh, in 2018, we then uh, invested in a virtual energy management system, uh, which is uh, crucial for us to know exactly where are we wasting energy, to have a data-driven approach for us to then focus continuous investments to uh, get that return on investment by reducing our, uh, our energy usage. Uh, um, so uh, that has now led to um, a, a big tank installment in 2019. Uh, as a manufacturer of cosmetic goods, we operate massive mixing vessels that are very energy um, uh, intensive in terms of the, the energy they use per se, but also the, the heating and cooling of water. Um, and uh, that machine alone um, has uh, reduced 50% of the use that we have in that department. Uh, we've also started a major uh, revamping of our uh, utilities. That means heating and chilling of the water uh, that we use uh, and the steam production. Uh, that's going to be a 4.5 million utility upgrade that has uh, started last year and will go well through this year and into next year. Um, uh, that will also lead to a reduction of 40% uh, of, um, of um, the heating and cooling of, of the steam that's such a big part of our manufacturing process. Um, and um, the data really helped us point in the direction where we can have focused uh, investments to continue to reduce our energy usage. Um, and uh, finally, to really um, prove that our, um, we put our money where our mouth is. We also started um, getting 
external certifications through Ecovadis, which is a uh, globally renowned and accepted uh, auditor uh, of your uh, corporate social responsibility and energy and sustainability. Um, and there we have uh, achieve, achieved the 65th percentile in 2019 and 2020 we have increased um, uh, or moved up to the 87th percentile which uh, compares us um, with 450 other companies across the globe um, because um, doing all this work is great but it's also uh, nice to get the um, recognition and uh, see how you are comparing with uh, other peers. So that's something that we are continuously doing to really show that uh, what we're doing is comparable and actually is true. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much our story so far. Um, and we are really uh, continuing on this path uh, to continue to reduce our energy use and our footprint on uh, society and environment. Awesome story. Thank you for uh, telling us all that. And it's, it's great to see the continuing improvement that you're doing. And we see this a lot where folks start down the path and then they just keep going. And I think I was transitioning between the Department of the Environment and uh, MEA at the time you got your um, sustainability award for, uh, from them. So that, that was um, really exciting. And I think right after that, there was an RMI banquet that you were also uh, highlighted and so that's what I said. I, I see you all over the place. You guys are doing great work. So thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Um, next, we have Viraj, and I'm hoping I'm getting this right. Uh, Viraj Puri, co founder and CEO of Gotham Greens, and he's here with us today. Uh, Viraj, your national high tech hydroponic greenhouse company expanded its operation in Maryland in 2019. And yours is a great story of energy efficiency and sustainability through innovation. Um, if anyone, if you haven't been through a hydroponics greenhouse, uh, we've worked with several um, throughout the years at, on energy efficiency projects. And they're really something to see. Um, the operations are really awesome to see and, and a lot of energy usage there. So uh, can you briefly tell us more about that? Good morning. Thank you, Mary, for the warm introduction. Nice to meet everybody. As you pointed out, we're new to Maryland, so we are delighted with this opportunity to introduce the company to a broader audience, and congratulations to the um, all the folks who do the good work in energy efficiency. By way of quick background, my, uh, my background is in environmental engineering and energy efficiency, and I stumbled into uh, what's known as controlled environment farming. And I became enamored with the technology while working at an engineering firm and really saw the potential of this form of farming to reduce energy use, reduce land use and water use and pollution and other externalities that are associated with uh, traditional conventional open field agriculture. So uh, we're a New York based company. We have operations in five U.S. states and uh, employ about 400, uh, 400 people nationally. And we really wanted to have a presence in the mid-Atlantic region. And so we, we select across the country to reach consumers on the East Coast. So that's a lot of transportation mileage and associated emissions and fossil fuel usage. And then it also results in a lot of fresh produce having to be thrown away, it goes to the landfill, releases methane gas, which we all know is a large contributor um, to, to, to climate change. So um, our form of farming, because we're able to grow in such close proximity to a large marketplace, we can cut down on a lot of distribution costs, trucking costs, associated emissions with that, and then sharply reduce food waste because the lettuce lasts a lot longer in a shopper's fridge. We also use 95% less water to grow um, a head of lettuce and um, do so using a lot less land. So we're, we're delighted to be in Maryland. We're delighted to have our products uh, on supermarket shelves. Um, across uh, the mid-Atlantic and we are honored with this recognition. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Um, you, you highlight uh, one item that people kind of overlook is the control of all these systems and that really can make a big difference in your energy usage. You're not heating the whole place or cooling the whole place at one time and, and you know when the heating or the cooling needs to come on and that kind of thing and, and it can be controlled in different areas so that's one area that we work with a lot of companies on and uh, it's one area that a lot of people it's, it's not if you're not in the field you don't really realize that that's a very important part of it so thank you for highlighting that and your industry it's an industry that not many of us realize is, is uh, very active in Maryland agriculture is a 
is a large uh, industry in Maryland and hydroponics is part of that. And so really appreciate your comments. Um, we are also joined today by John Fox, advisor for Exco. Um, John, your company provides a product and service to help manufacturers realize cost savings and even improve comfort for employees in a manufacturing space. Will you tell us a little about the benefits of Maryland manufacturer experience as a result of the work your company performed to help them be more energy efficient and save costs? Yes, uh, thanks Dr. Tung and thanks everybody. Thanks to RMI and MEA and all the sponsors. It's exciting to see so many faces and pages um, of the webinar, so that's surprising, it's great. Great work by RMI to make this happen. Um, we're a little different. We, we haven't done any um, energy efficiency improvements ourselves, like the, the three panelists that just spoke. We actually enable, uh, we have an enabling technology that people may be interested in as long as the fit is right. And the fit is, we focus on high ceiling facilities. Um, and by, what I mean by that is obviously manufacturing facilities might have 20, 30 foot ceilings even higher, uh, warehouses and big box stores. So think of large volumes of space. We're not, we're not residential, we're not uh, office buildings, something like that. Large volumes of space that use forced air heating to heat and cool uh, the building. So rooftop units and high ceilings is where our technology fits in. Um, the product is called the Exco Flow Controller. And it's basically designed to have better, better thermal management for that system and focusing on the occupied space. So you, you might have a 30 foot ceiling, but the occupants don't really care what's going on at 30 feet. They care what's going on from zero to six feet or zero to eight feet. And also the equipment on the floor, may, the machinery may care about that too. So by focusing on a smaller volume of space and the way we manage the air, the supply and return of air, you can actually reduce your heating and ventilation costs significantly. So um, think of a, a large facility, rooftop units on top, and then we, we basically sit underneath the rooftop unit inside the building, and we divert air. Today, it might be supplied 25, 30 feet in the air, the return is applier at the ceiling, the occupants are 30 feet away. We divert the air, depending on the ambient condition in the building, or in the demands of the building, to maybe supply low or supply high or return high or return low. So we actually can vary um, the ability of the, of the system to be thermally managed right where the occupants are. And it easily integrates under commercial um, HVAC contractors can easily integrate our equipment under the rooftop inside the building and then supply some ductwork that allows for the flexibility of control that we provide. So in heating mode, we actually wanna de-stratify the air. If you think of a 30 foot ceiling, obviously heat rises, and you know that there's accumulated air at that ceiling and there's gonna be higher temperature than it is at the floor. Well, if you can move that air down, and you could use a, a big ass fan, which is a, a technology, but you can move that air down, that's a blending technology. Our technology actually moves it right to where the occupants are, so you use less energy doing that. If you move it to the occupied space, you're putting less BTUs into the building. And then in cooling mode, when cooling um, is ha happening 30 feet in the air, the buoyancy of the air is on your side this time, the, the cold air drops, but the problem again is your input to the RTU is the hottest temperature in the building, is the highest temperature in the building, so then you have to add more energy to the RTU to drive the temperatures down and you're just consuming more uh, kilowatts. So if you could supply the cold air at the occupant level and then, and then stratify the air on purpose and let the top of the building uh, get warmer, you're not, again, you're not putting in as, as much energy into the building. And then we also, because of the design of our system, we have passive mode where you actually just turn on the fans. And the fans are just uh, basically removing the hot air off the ceiling and supply it right where the, the occupants are. So we did a building in, uh, it was called Homatro, it's a, and it was done with RMI support. Our, and the University of Maryland did a study, and it's by BWI, 15 month study, six month pre and nine month post, saved about $20,000 a year. Uh, and, and how it does the savings is in a very satisfied customer, how it does the savings is the rooftop units don't run as hard, they don't run as often, you can change your set points, uh, you know, uh, higher for cooling or lower for heating because of your focus on the, we're just the occupied space. Um, you may have to supply 55 degree air at the ceiling at 30 feet to get the occupants at 70 degrees down below. If you supply that air right where the occupants are, you don't need 55 degree air, so obviously you're not using as much energy. Um, and in Hamatro, only 50% of the building was retrofitted and we still saved 10% of the utility costs. So if we had retrofitted the full, utility, uh, full 
number of RTUs, we did 10 of 18. If we had retrofitted the full count, the significant, the savings would have been even higher than 10%. And that's 10% on the total facility costs, not just the HVAC costs. We're about 30% improvement in the HVAC costs uh, annually. So the two, Alana and Cornelius mentioned that they did LED lighting and, and a lot of people have done LED lighting. Hamatro at the same time that they put in the flow controller also did LED lighting. And the total sum of the savings, we were about 50% and the LED lighting was about 50%. So to give you a scale for what our technology has the impact, if you're familiar with LED and you were happy with your return on investment and it was something to do, you know, it's easily understood, it's prescriptive. Ours is gonna be a little more custom, but the impact can be the same level of impact uh, such as LED. Um, with that $20,000 savings, if you financed it and if you got an incentive, you could be under two year payback, potentially under one year. I mean, that's how significant the savings can be. And it depends on your utility rates, the size of your building and all that. And we'd be happy to evaluate a building. Um, we also did a manufacturing facility that was struggling in, in a Maryland summers. It couldn't keep set point. It was getting to 80 degrees on the shop floor. They're not only concerned about the employees satisfied, satisfied, uh, Sad of kids, sad of kids, whoa, <laughs> the employee's temperature, but they were also concerned about the parts um, because they were manufacturing department defense tight tolerance parts. They were gonna buy more RTUs and they heard about the flow controller. They put two in of six RTUs and in five hours, the temperature dropped four degrees. Um, and then the uh, floor temperature dropped a degree and the occupants were satisfied, the, the machines were satisfied. And instead of putting new tonnage in, and a lot more capital expenditure, <clears throat> they actually did five of the six RTUs. So um, uh, we're an enabling technology for those that are listening that have high ceiling facilities that have, um, or know of people that work in high ceiling facilities or uh, service high ceiling facilities, we'd be happy to do an evaluation. Um, there's a great five minute video on our website and we'd be happy to help you through this and analyze your building and hopefully it's something that fits in your facility. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate your comments from the um, installer's point of view. Um, you know, uh, someone who's going out working with folks and, and getting these energy efficiency um, projects into play. So really appreciate your your um, viewpoint on this. Uh, it's a little different than uh, those who are are receiving your services. So that that's um, really nice for us to to hear from you as well. I think Stacy has a comment she'd like uh, to make. I just want to let people know, I understand there's an issue with the chat and I'm not sure why I tried to figure it out, but what I'm doing is making everyone a co-host, which seems to be opening up the chat. So I'm now going individually making each of you a co-host. So for those of you who've had a question, haven't been able to submit it, um, you will be able to shortly as I'm making you each a co-host. Thanks. Just want to let people know that you can still put something in through the chat. Thanks, Stacy. Yeah, I haven't been able, I wasn't able to respond to you there when you um, asked about uh, speaking. So I did see it. I just wasn't able to respond. So thank, thank you. you for doing that. Um, I have a couple general questions now to ask. Um, now that we've gotten everyone's background information, I, I did do a little bit more of a deep dive here uh, than we've been doing. So the first question, um, is for John Fox of Exco and Elena Kessy of Aquafin. Elena and John, this question um, is for the two of you. And um, do you think that some of the energy efficiency changes and upgrades you have made your, your facility, or in your case, John, to Homatro's facility are benefiting your company and employees during this time when COVID-19 greatly is impacting how we look at work, workplace health and safety? And I know, um, Laney, you had touched on that um, earlier, um, but you know, health and safety right now are very important and, and how are these energy efficiency um, upgrades helping in that area? So I don't know who wants to take that first, but. <laughs> um, I, I can go ahead. So I definitely think they helped, you know, in addition to the benefits that I mentioned before, having the all new HVAC units and, you know, really increases air quality. And so all of the offices where the employees were still coming to work every day, they have better air quality um, out on the shop floor, having better lighting just made a huge difference. 
And so in addition to the air quality and then the lighting, it was also, I, I really think one of the biggest impacts was just the morale boost, the fact that our company saw that, you know, we're still investing in the company during a time that is, is a difficult time and that we're moving forward with projects. Things didn't grind to a halt and we kept going as much as we could business as usual. Um, and so absolutely, this had a huge impact. Mary, you got to unmute. Wow, that's weird how I got on mute. Um, mm -hmm. So John, <laughs> um, I'm sure you have a viewpoint on this as well. Yeah, so um, first off, we all know that um, the answer to COVID is not one solution. Um, everybody should be, you know, masking up and social distance, washing your hands, trying not to gather, to hopefully getting the vaccine in your arm as soon as you can, all the above, right? We all know that. And I'll do a disclaimer that I'm not Dr. Fauci, but I have tried to educate myself on this topic and w because we do have an impact and a, a positive impact. And I've watched several um, webinars put on by ASHRAE and it's, and it's interesting, right? So they say directionally correct, right? No one, no one's gonna know if your building is 100% safe. I mean, my analogy is your, your building's 100% safe if no one's sick in the building. It, no one's gonna tell you if your building's 100% safe if someone's sick in the building, but there are things you can do and actions you can take um, to try to directionally correct, add indoor air, improve your indoor air quality for your employees. And, and you know, and that's a PR. It's marketing. It's making sure your employees feel safe. Um, so Ashley will tell you: increase the MERV rating as high as you can on your filters, right? They will tell you to increase your makeup air as much as you can. Bring in more, bring in more outside outside air. Um, now, obviously, depending on where you live and what season you're in, the bringing in makeup air and increasing your outside air is going to cost more money. And your, and your system may not be able to keep you up. And if you increase your MERV filtration rating, your system's gonna um, take more kilowatts. They, they say, you know, open, open the windows as best you can, get more outside air in, not just through the filtration system, not just through the RTUs, but through your, your own doors and windows. Um, they say, start your HVAC equipment early. Before, before the occupants show up, start your system. And after the, after the occupants leave, leave your system running. So, and then some actually do UV lighting or other new technologies. The, the thing about all those actions, which are the right things to do, all increase energy usage. Every, every one of them increases the amount that it's gonna cost you to heat and cool your building. Now, obviously, employee safety is important. So, as I described, we tie into an HVAC system and could have a 30% impact on that HVAC system. Also, so we could offset the costs of makeup air and, and increase MERV filter ratings, et cetera. So we can offset the increased costs of uh, actions towards indoor air quality improvements. But also because we focus on the um, occupied space, right, where the people are, where people are breathing, we actually increase the air changes per hour. So we're directionally correct also. We're, we're filtering more where the people are not just the whole volume of space. If you think of that big you know, Walmart, if you're filtering air right where the people are, you're actually increasing the air changes per hour. The other thing we do is because we can supply low in passive mode and, and cooling mode, we actually bring in the makeup air right where the people breathe. So instead of bringing the makeup air 30 feet in the air and having it blend into the entire building, we can actually bring in the makeup air in the two modes, cooling and passive mode, two modes of the three, um, we actually supply the air from, and if you're increasing your makeup air percentage, you're actually bringing more makeup air right to the breathing and the occupied zone where people are breathing. So with all those benefits, um, you could definitely increase the indoor air quality and then offset the cost of the energy usage, the increased energy usage by implementing the, the flow controller at, at this, if, if your building is the right, right fit. So we definitely have an impact and love to talk to people about that. So I guess to follow up a little bit with both of you, do you think that COVID might be ushering in um, some changes in how we look at um, airflow through buildings? You know, even once the vaccine's out there, you know, there's flu season, there's always these health issues, um, communicable diseases that, that are gonna be floating around, you know, every year we get flu. Um, so do you think that COVID has maybe changed how people look at this? And as we move forward, we might be seeing changes 
in, in how airflow handling is, is done, and, and particularly in light of energy efficiency efforts. So the question's for both of you. I, I guess I'll your mic up, so <laughs> yeah, you I'll, 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 yeah. I mean, you know, I hope, right? You you hope that this is not a, uh, you know, in in six months, twelve months, two years, this has gone away. I mean, the initial when people said when they Ashley said, hey, increase your MERV rating to I think it was thirteen or higher, uh, you couldn't find MERV filters. You know, to, you couldn't buy them, right? So there was a shortage. So people reacted, and they re reacted correctly. Um, is this a long-term thing? I, I hope people learn, and I hope we all learn that indoor air quality. We all we always heard that your indoor air quality could be like five five times worse than the outside air, but that doesn't mean we've ever done anything about it. So yes, and I think people. So I think certain companies that are more aggressive and more focused on their employee satisfaction and their concern, and and actually take it as a marketing, you know, a, a, as an employee. Um, you know, benefit that we do X, Y, and Z to increase the indoor air quality for our facilities. That people are going to offset themselves by doing that. Um, but I'm sure, I'm sure, unfortunately, we're humans, and some will go right back to, and some don't even wear masks today. So some will go right back to being exactly who they are today. So I'm hopeful. I mean, I, I'm the optimist. <laughs> Yeah, I would, I mean, I would agree with a lot of that um, coming from a position of not being, you know, a technical person in this industry and not really having thought about it prior to COVID. I do think that it's something that has made people more aware of it. Um, and I think it's always something we're going to think about more, whether I don't, I don't think it's going to be at the forefront of everyone's thoughts in the future when, you know, we're kind of past this and and, and we get back to it. But I, I do think it's going to be a lot of changes. And I think there is going to be residual information that people who weren't maybe focused on it prior to are going to focus on afterwards. Thank you both for your thoughts. Um, Mary, this is Mike Galeazzo. Yeah. Hi, Mike. To, um, to, to, the group, to the conversation, because I think right on target with this topic of um, more safe environment, work environment. Uh, I, and, and Mike Kelleher is on the line, uh, Mike and I and, and several other manufacturers across the state uh, were, were asked to serve on, on a committee to help recommend to the governor uh, actions that companies, manufacturers should take to create a safer environment because of COVID. And I think it's important to let everybody know that when the governor came back with their recommendations to manufacturers. And a lot of it dealt more with the, the whole issue of the employees and you know taking temperatures and where, all that. But one of the key recommendations was exactly the topic we're talking about, ventilation systems. So there was an aware, and, and re, as it came from ASHRAE, so there's a real recognition coming in that they're dealing with the whole issue of the quality of the air and the ventilation is uh, significant, I think, in this fight against COVID, but perhaps equally important in keeping manufacturers open. Um, so, and Eric Kaufman and others that you're on your team know that I feel very strongly that uh, right now, that this safe work environments by helping to update HVAC systems and ventilation systems and, and other systems that can help improve air quality, keep people safe, I think is really critically important. Uh, and we want to, and RMI is going to, as you may know, we're going to continue to get that message out through some webinars and things like that. But um, I, I think right now that's what's on people's mind, how to keep our employees safe. Absolutely. And I know the discussion came up in our own building, um, you know, before we started going back in small numbers, uh, you know, is the ventilation system up to snuff uh, and, and bringing in that air, um, quality that that we needed you know the outside air and whatnot we have an old building we're located many of you probably know in the old Montgomery Wards building in Baltimore so it's kind of a leaky building anyway so it, it, it wasn't an issue that much but they did increase but again you know uh, point well taken it does add a cost to your energy usage to circulate uh, the air and in higher amounts so um, building that into energy efficiency in the future I, I I think is something that's probably really well, well worth looking into, even when we get past COVID, because you know we lo we lose a lot of employee hours 
the flu and other things. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's something I think everyone should be looking at. Yeah. So I mean, thank you, Mike. Yeah, thanks, Go Mike. Ahead. Well, the issue of cost, it could be really expensive if you're not able to operate your company because of COVID. So, Absolutely. I, in fact, I find myself and mothers, and I would, uh, when I go anywhere nowadays, which I don't go to too many places, I always think in terms of what's the ventilation in this room that I'm in or in this building that I'm in. So <laughs> the things that are being talked about, I think are really critically important to all of us that are concerned about COVID. Occupational hazard for those of us that work in the energy field, we're always looking at lighting and airflow and <laughs> working with buildings. I find myself doing that as well. So I'm glad I'm not the only one. I thought I was a geek. Well, I am a geek, but um, anyway, thank you, Mike, for your comments. You. Um, I have a second question. This one um, is directed at, uh, at Cornelius Scrupp of Seacare and Viraj Puri of um, Gotham Greens. Um, what would you say to manufacturers, and this is, I, you know, this is something I'm really interested in your answers. What do you say to other manufacturers that say they are too busy or have other priorities? You know, we're making widgets, don't bu bug us with all this stuff. And, and, and don't think that energy efficiency and sustainability is something they should be focusing on right now. So I don't know who wants to take that question first. What do you say to other manufacturers? Well, yeah, um, I think that's a great question. And um, I think if we look at um, the time we're living in at the moment, we have just come out of the hottest decade since the recording of uh, temperature. We're about to have the hottest year, 2020, since the recording of temperature. And uh, we've seen two continents burn uh, this year. We've had uh, more um serious hurricanes or major hurricanes than ever before here in the u.s and really um, nobody can deny that the world and climate is changing so um i think it is our duty as business leaders uh, decision makers uh, to uh, confront climate change uh, and to commit to sustainability strategies um, for our families for our communities and for the next generations so uh, I think uh, governments, uh, companies, stakeholders, and shareholders have to engage considering what we are being faced with as climate change is the biggest challenge that um, we as a human uh, kind have to tackle. So I think that is a start. Why, if anybody says they're too busy um, doing their day-to-day -day business, what build a business for if there is a, a very different tomorrow that your business might not even be able to compete in? Um, secondly, if that is not enough, um, the awareness has changed dramatically uh, from end consumers to uh, customers uh, to the large OEMs in the world. Um, we already seen a, uh, an aggressive shift of major investors. I um, mean, just think about BlackRock, how many uh, investments uh, or money streams that they have shifted to companies that are tackling. Uh, climate change or that have at least a sustainability strategy. So um, being uh, in the fight against climate change and have a sustainability strategy is, is part of the competitive advantage um, that we have to embrace, right? Um, the end consumer is uh, informed. The end consumer is educated in what sustainability means, at least at the product level. But um, we're seeing more and more down on the supply chain that uh, the big corporations are enforcing their climate goals, their uh, CO2 emission goals, uh, their packaging development goals. So um, it's not even, uh, at least in our field, it's not even an option not to participate. Um, then um, I also don't think that uh, companies without purpose um, have the chance for long-term uh, profitability. Um, I think the times are over that companies can capitalize short term at the expense of society and environment. Um, and um, so I think even from a long term profitability goal, if you want to look at it, it's highly important to at least uh, wrap your head around how you can positively contribute to your own uh, sustainability strategy. Um, and um, further, uh, if, if all of that is not enough for you, I think um, <laughs> market will simply demand um, of companies uh, to participate and then eventually and hopefully soon governments will also demand uh, that uh, companies 
um, uh, put a price or that there's a price on externalities. And uh, I think that uh, if you don't get ready for, for this development in the market, you will simply be left behind. So um, if, you don't, if you don't get on the train, I think uh, you're going to uh, take the shorter end of the stick. So I think uh, it's, it's highly important that we all um, have a strategy in that direction. And as we've seen today, there is payback, right? Um, there's payback on energy reduction. Uh, there's payback on efficiencies. Um, uh, that uh, there's so many aspects that if anybody tells me they're too lazy or don't care about about this important topic of our society, then um, I find it hard to uh, I find it hard for them not to find an argument why uh, why they shouldn't get on the on the train. Raj, do you have? I'm I'm sure you do have um, some comments as well. Yeah, I certainly do. Uh, that's a hard act to follow though, because I feel like uh, he hit the nail on. <laughs> every single point um, you know it's it's around actually saving money it might be a little bit of extra effort but um, energy efficiency measures have a very positive return on investment in most cases of just a couple of years and the marketplace is going to get more competitive regardless of the industry that you're in and finding ways to reduce cost is is I think going to resonate with any business um, and again I, I don't want to just reiterate all the points that were just made but uh, customers and the end the end consumer as well as a business customer is going to start demanding this more and more we see this all the time we get questions from our end consumers about our sustainability profile what we're doing uh, to address climate change uh, younger demographic of consumers are increasingly interested in this and this is backed up by by syndicated data survey data panel data um, and then finally I think the regulatory environment will start to require these sorts of things um, and, and and there will be a price on on carbon um, in, in some way shape or form um, in the years to come so um, in the interest of time I won't just uh, repeat everything that was just said I think that was great no thank you very much uh, good comments and and I think you're right uh, people are are looking at this um, and as you mentioned a lot of the younger folks that are coming in are really focused on it um, and you know just want to Get in there that you know it's, it's kind of the the money savings is is real and when you're adding to the bottom line that that helps so it's a, it's a win-win you know you're helping the environment uh which is really important and and you're helping your bottom line you know there's not too many cases where you get the win-wins like that so um i um would like to turn it back to tracy briefly i think she has something she'd like to say Thanks. Um, talking about the uh, energy program um, and you're hearing thanks to RMI and things like that, I just want to make everyone aware that we are um, working with uh, Maryland Energy Administration on a grant program that some of you that are listening today may be eligible to participate in. So if you're in the Pepco or Delmarva power area um, and want more information, please contact us because our role in this, we are funded by the Maryland Energy Administration to be your, basically be your uh, personnel to help you identify ways that you can save energy. We can send our energy engineers in there at, at no cost to you to do an assessment of your facility and find ways where you may be able to um, uh, take advantage of energy savings or um, get energy rebates and um, uh, find ways to pay for the upgrades. As Elena mentioned, um, the cost of hers was pretty substantial and we helped her identify funding sources, whether it was loans or rebates and uh, uh, um, other incentives. And we actually can do the legwork on filling out those applications and helping you um, uh, read through the um, scope of work from vendors that, and help you um, understand what these vendors are going to do. And so anyway, we've got the team, we've got the expertise here that we can bring to the table for you at no cost to you. So I just wanna encourage those of you that may not be familiar with this program, we'll send, um, when we send an email out, I'll put contact information for myself and Peter that you can reach out to us and we're happy to talk, talk further with you to see if it's something that your organization can take advantage of. The grant program ends uh, June 30th, if I'm correct, June 30th of 2021. And I believe there's about $500,000 left to, to be used towards that. So there's money there, um, but it's a, a limited time frame. So just encourage you to, to get in touch with us. 
And if I could just touch on that real quick, Stacy. Last year when I was at the program, I kind of walked out of there thinking, well, this all sounds too good to be true. And, you know, I'm sure, sure there, there's, there has to be strings attached and there has to be hidden things. And it really wasn't. I mean, RMI did all the legwork for us. It was it was a hundred percent what Stacy just said. And if it wasn't for them, we would not have been able to take advantage of this because we just simply don't have the resources in-house to do the engineering, to understand the grant process, and to you know take the time to walk through the facility and do the assessment. So what she said is a hundred percent true. And if anybody is in the opportunity or in a position to to do these kinds of things, I highly, highly recommend reaching out to RMI. Thanks, Elena. Nandini, can you just say just hello, just so that we can see your face, because she's our energy <clears throat> engineer that we send in. Um, and I think if she speak, if she says something, her bit, her face should show up on here. Mm -hmm. Nandini, you're I think on mute. There she is. Oh, were you were you prepared? <laughs> Sorry, I just okay, wanted you all okay. to put a face with a name. So Nandini is yeah. our um, energy engineer that we would send out to uh, work with you and and help you through the process. So just wanted yes. to put a face with a name. That's all. Thanks. Ab absolutely. Yes. Okay. And she's also a star. <laughs> oh my God, I don't know about that. I don't know about that, Peter. But it is an awesome team, and uh, it was great working with Elena and everybody to make sure that uh, we understand and especially what Elena said uh, related to some specific um, um, transformers is a very difficult um, energy efficiency measure to go through and make sure but we got quite a bit out of that um, particular measure and so on. So um, the uh, opportunities come in different flavors, different facilities, different type of um, um, age and operations and whatnot. And so I think um, we have the bandwidth to go through whatever is your need and help you out in different um, um, ways. So do check us out and uh, would be happy to uh, work with you um, whenever you are able to get in touch with us. Thank you. Thank you. Um... And uh, she's also an alumnus of MEA, so. <laughs> and a woman in energy, I wanna keep uh, emphasizing that. Um, ladies do engineering and, and um, energy stuff too. Um, so we're at the point where we um, can take some questions from the audience. I'm trying to look through the list here um, uh, to make sure I get everybody. Um, Mary, I think the only one that hasn't been answered is the one that says, how can more oh um, manufacturers um, get engaged in energy efficiency projects? Uh, yeah, that's the one I was seeing. Yeah. So anyone can answer that. Um, I, I'll just, I'll just start a little bit on this. Um, you know, folks look at these projects and immediately the price tag comes out. Um, and that's one thing. There's a price tag issue. There's also a time issue. You know, we don't have time. We're, we're doing this, we're doing that. You know, we're trying to run our company. So there, there's these two issues and, and uh, it's, it's very difficult sometimes to convince folks that this is worth it. So the upfront cost is one that uh, we try to help with, RMI is trying to help you. And also, where do you start? What do you do? You know, I, I widgets, I, I do skincare products, I do, you know, uh, hydroponics, I, you know, I, I make whatever. And, um, you know, so where do I start? I'm not an energy expert. I don't have any energy experts and I can't afford to hire somebody. So this is where we can come in and then help. This is where our mic can help. This is where our team of experts can help. Um, you've heard a lot about um, MEA's team of experts and we have engineers and scientists on staff and this is what they do. And we also have contractors uh, who can provide some expertise as well. Um, and so when we work with you, it isn't just let's, you know, give you a grant or a loan and go off and do your thing. Uh, we help support you and RMI is a very important um, component of that uh, for those projects that we're working with our RMI uh, on and, and they've done an awesome, awesome job. And I will tell you that, you know, it's hard for a state agency to approach manufacturers. You know, you don't understand us, you know, you're a bunch of state employees, you don't know what we do. And we are state employees and we probably don't know what you do, but um, we, 
it's hard for us to approach manufacturers. So this is where RMI has been very helpful for us because they were able to come in and you, you all speak the same language and you have a trust built up with RMI. So we, we really enjoy uh, working with RMI and they have provided for us uh, a very good service in getting folks involved in this. So, you know, for us to try to convince you that this is important to do, we have to have that open door, uh, open line of communications to begin with. So um, the RMI is, is a, a really, really good resource for those of you that aren't familiar. You're on this call, so obviously <laughs> you're, you're somewhat familiar with RMI. Um, but we, we have a team of experts that are able to, to help as well. So I just wanted to open it up for our panelists, uh, if anybody has any uh, comments as well. Anyone? I know you're out there. Yeah, I, I guess I'll just say, that, like everybody's the same thing. It's, it's hard to implement. It, it does take time. And I think the priorities, you, you said people want to make, they want to put their heads down and make the cosmetics or the Aquafin products or the um, leafy greens in Maryland, which is really cool. But, uh, but a lot of said it earlier, the $20,000 she was saving a year goes right to her bottom line. You never spend that $20,000. So it's, uh, and, w and with the support of RMI, there's, uh, there shouldn't be a reason to at least have the reach out and do the investigations. Yeah, if I would, if I can add, I wasn't uh, the CEO here when uh, we were implementing the pro program in 2015 and 2016. But um, uh, what the team has told me that um, uh, you know we are a mid-sized company here, and uh, and even today we would not have uh, the capacity in terms of uh, people to actually execute that just by ourselves. So uh, it was a huge help that we received exactly as. Um, uh, we just heard um, in terms of engineering, in terms of helping plan out and help, helping also to apply for these grants, right? If you're not used to applying for grants, um, how do you start? Where do you start? So we really had a tremendous amount of help. And I can only um, recommend to try also to get the support because uh, when you have it, it's, uh, it's really helps um, push it along and, and getting these projects completed and funded especially. Niraj or Elena, any further comments? I know Elena, you've gone into this somewhat already. Yeah, I'm, you know, like I said, uh, if anybody on the call is thinking about it and wants to reach out to me personally and, and you know, hear my take on the process and, and how it went, I'm more than happy to talk to anybody else. Um, one thing I've been really grateful for being a manufacturer here in Cecil County is just then that, you know, the community of, of companies. Um, I've been able to reach out to other business owners as well and, and ask them about their process and how things have, they do things. And so I'm more than happy to have anybody reach me personally if you want to ask questions about how the whole thing went. And, you know, Peter Nandini, Stacy, Dr. Tung, everybody, thank you very much for this opportunity. We're really extremely grateful and we can't wait to reinvest our, the money that we're saving in future upgrades. I'm, I'm already planning and budgeting, so I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Uh, Raj, I think I mispronounced your name earlier. Do you have anything else to um, add yep. to this? You nailed it. Yeah, you know, one, one uh, theme that we haven't, I agree with everything that's been said, one theme that we haven't talked about, which I think could be interesting and a little thought provoking for the group is um, potentially to invest in vocational training for, for people to uh, run um, energy efficiency programs or, or go as the go between between these programs, uh, between uh, vendors, OEMs, um, and the end user. Um, as well as for manufacturers like us, um, having the skilled personnel to be in-house, to be on our teams, to be able to uh, be maintenance technicians uh, and or facilities managers for these types of technologies. So that it could be a compelling uh, economic development opportunity, job creation opportunity to partner with uh, universities and or uh, vocational training programs to uh, equip young, young and old uh, like graduates um, with, with the necessary skills to contribute to the, the, what I'll call the energy efficiency economy. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to um, direct everyone's attention to the chat box now that's working. Um, there's uh, links to some of our programs. Um, there's also um, some invitations from our staff to please uh, contact us. 
and uh, they're more than willing to, to walk you through the process. Unfortunately, right now, the, um, the program through RMI is only available in uh, Pepco and Delmarva that's because it's a source of funding um, right now. Uh, we did have a BGE program, which worked really well, um, but that program has ended because of source funding. Um, so we are available at MEA to help you uh, walk through this process. And, and, and as I had mentioned earlier, one of the things that um, you, know, you deal with in a, as a company is where do I even start? Uh, and um, an energy audit is one, one place to start. So you know what needs to be done, but that has a cost uh, associated with it as well. So um, that's where we'd like to step in and try to help. That's where RMI and those areas can step in and, and help. And um, you know, it's, it, it's a daunting when you first start the process, uh, but once you get the lingo and, and get, the, get going in your area, um, it, it becomes, a lot easier for you to, to move forward and, and you're not there by yourself. We're there to help you. Uh, we have email addresses. Elena just put her email address in the chat box. I'm sorry, but the chat box is this tiny little print and I've got old eyes, so I have to get close here. Um, I'm just trying to see if I'm missing any questions. I don't think so. I'm not seeing any. Uh, I, okay. We do have Mike Kelleher. Somebody uh, mentioned he's on the line. So um, I don't know, Mike, do you want to give a word or two um, since you missed out at the beginning? Thank you, Mary, and, and great to see you and everybody. Um, I'll keep it brief. I just, you know, want to say that Maryland MEP is, is, is happy and proud to support this initiative and, and obviously all of our RMI's initiatives. And, but we think the, the Champion Series is fantastic to raise the level of awareness for the manufacturing community and do exactly what you all did a, a great job of today. Tell the story of the manufacturers and why manufacturing is important. And I think that the conversation today around energy and, and, and savings and the environmental aspects are, are really critical to uh, where Maryland can, can put a stake in the ground moving forward and, and start to raise the bar for what manufacturing is. So we're happy to be a partner. We're happy to sponsor the, the effort um, and as always, Maryland MEP is is got some resources and and some funding and some services. If anyone's interested, please feel free to reach out. But great job, all, and and what fantastic stories and congrats to our champions. Thank you, Mike. It's good to see you again. Mike and I are uh, Leadership Maryland uh, graduates, so <laughs> we spent a year together. What about a year and a half ago? It, it doesn't seem that long, but uh, uh, good to see you again. Um, Mary, so thank you, Joel. I'm sorry, this is Mike Galeazzo interrupting you again. <laughs> oh, that's okay. That's okay. fine. You're allowed uh, to. Before we end, I, I, I want to again thank you, but I also want to let the group understand that our program has been successful primarily because of the, the leadership of Peter Gorley. Peter has been a remarkable leader and helping uh, his team and the companies come together to make all these successes we're talking about today possible. And we all know, Peter, you've, you've had a major personal challenge that you've overcome, but I gotta tell you, we would not be here today celebrating all these successes if it wasn't for your type of leadership that's, that's very focused on individuals, trustworthiness, and doing the right thing. So Peter Gorley, Former Marine, I salute you today. My understanding is once a Marine, always a Marine. So he's still oh, Marine. Right. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. I was Air Force. I was Air Force. <laughs> my son's Army. So we have, you know, which is what I have over my shoulder here, uh, Army Aviation, if anyone oh. see it. So, so it's all good. And thank you all for your service to our country. Um, I'm going to turn it back to Stacy uh, to close us out. This has been an awesome time, and I really appreciate the opportunity to do this. So uh, back to Stacy. Thank you. Just want to thank all of our panelists and our sponsors, promotional partners, everybody for being involved with this, making this happen. And uh, to all of you that have tuned in, our next webinar will be, our next Champions webinar is in January, uh, date to be determined, but look for that coming in within a week or so. And we'll be covering the topic of resiliency and, and some great success stories in, in resiliency in the manufacturing sector. Um, I'll send an email this afternoon with the recording and um, uh, all the links and things that you heard about today. So look for that coming this afternoon yeah
Yep. Can I just say sure. one thing just for a yeah. second? So my doctors just came in as you, were, you guys were all talking and they basically gave me a clean bill of health. I'm discharged and um, the MRI that they did, they were worried that I had a condition called myocarditis. That's why I was in the hospital. They have no evidence that that's there. The only, there's, a, there's an enzyme called troponin that basically says your heart's under stress. And that was raised at such a level they submitted me to the hospital. But the good news is that it just was the heart surgery that was raising that troponin. So Yay. I'm good to go. I'm wheels up tomorrow. Be arriving back in Timonium tomorrow. Awesome. Yay, that's great news. <laughs> a great note to end on. So thank you, Peter. And thanks everybody for tuning in. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. See you all. Thank you.